we're in our final week of this little series that we've called Prophets. Um, last week, we talked about Elijah fleeing and, 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 you know, with Jezebel and going to the cave and all of that. And I don't think I've ever received more text messages, Facebook posts or, or emails or anything about any one sermon that I've ever done. And so I want to say thank you for that. I'm glad it was a blessing to you. If you missed it, you can go back and watch it online. Um, it was unique preparing for that message. Uh, God gave some, some, some new angles of, of a story that I've preached many, many times before. And that's the way the word is. The Holy Spirit brings new life and, and fresh uh, perspectives on stuff we've looked at over and over. That's the miracle of God's word. And so I really do appreciate all of that. The problem with that, I realized on Monday, when you preach a message like that that connects so well, guess what? i got to preach again this Sunday. So I, all I'm saying is, you know, no judgment. I've got some coin in the bank. That's all I'm saying. If I drop it today, just no judgment. No. Uh, I had planned on preaching... Um, on Samuel today, this last week, that was, that was what was in the schedule. So I began studying that, but I just couldn't get a piece about that message for this particular week. And so I began to pray about that and study the word, look in the word. And I ended up in the minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament in a little known book called Habakkuk. Habakkuk, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's, a, it's a short book, three chapters. It's not really as much prophetic. There's not as much prophecy in it. It's really about his wrestling with God, his questions, his hard questions about life, pain, suffering, injustice. And then it's about God's response to that. It really, if you summed it up, it would be, why God? Anybody been there? Why God? But he wisely didn't just spew his words everywhere. He directed them in prayer respectfully to the Father. And guess what? God answers him. God answers Habakkuk. Job would be jealous. <laughs> if you've read the book of Job, it's much longer. And he goes through a lot more. And you know about his friends that try to help him. And God doesn't speak until the very end after many years have gone by. But God speaks. God responds to Habakkuk, except it's not the answer he was looking for. It wasn't the response that he wanted. So today, our subtitle is, Even Though, Yet I Will. Even Though, Yet I Will. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for what we've already sensed in this service. God, thank you for preserving this story, this book from thousands of years ago. Thank you for preserving, Lord, what you did in the life of Habakkuk and how we can learn from it today. I pray that your word would become powerful and prophetic and life-changing. Let it be rhema to us today. Let us receive it with joy and thanksgiving because you are good and your mercies endure forever. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. So, have you just ever been frustrated with life? No? Maybe you're in a season right now where nothing you do, nothing you plan, nothing you're involved in seems to come together. I mean, you've worked hard, You've crossed every T, dotted every I, but it seems like every, at the end, something, the bottom just falls out. It just doesn't come together. And to make matters worse and more frustrating, you look around and it seems like everybody else is knocking it out of the park. You look at their social media, maybe you, you run into them at Walmart, talk, and it's like they've got the perfect life, perfect marriage, perfect kids, perfect career. They don't. But you think they do, and it's so frustrating, and you're like, are you kidding me? And then you're like, then, then you're like God, they don't even, they, they, they're heathens. They don't even love you. They don't even go to church. Why are they blessed, and I'm over here banging my head against the wall? Do I have the right room today? Yeah, Okay. Well, those are the same frustrations and, and, and the feeling of helplessness 
and comparison, that's a trap of the devil. (laughs) Comparing your life to somebody else. Boy, that's one that us preachers struggle with. Sometimes I wish Facebook would just go away. I have a great Sunday. We have an awesome day, and I make the mistake, JB, of going to my Facebook that afternoon, and I'm like, well, dear God. (laughs) Stupid. It's bad. Comparison is a trap from the devil. It will steal your joy. But this, these are the same emotions that Habakkuk, listen, Habakkuk is feeling, except times them by a thousand. Because he's living in a period of time. It's the worst period of Israel's history. Let me give you just a little bit of uh, context and background before we jump into the word. Habakkuk lived in Judah. Judah was in the south. The kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Israel in the north with ten tribes. Judah in the south with two. He was in the south. And the last four kings of Judah were evil, wicked. And they just led the people of God farther and farther away from his covenant and his goodness and his mercy. His hand is covering just farther and farther away and judgment was coming. And this wasn't out of the blue, y'all. Have you read the Old Testament? It wasn't out of the blue. Prophet after prophet, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all these guys prophesied, if you don't come back to me, Lord, being God, if you don't come back to the Lord, you're going to be judged. So this judgment was coming that he had promised, and this isn't a pleasant topic. This isn't the best, most fun thing to preach in the world. But God is still holy. God is just. And yes, we have Jesus. We're on the other side of the cross. We have the blood of Jesus. But judgment is still coming to this world. Just read the end of the book. And we need to be so close to the Father and walk so closely in step with his spirit that we don't miss him, that we don't miss the signs. We don't miss what he's doing or lose his voice in the cacophony and the chaos that we live in. So God would use the rising Babylonian empire. It had been Egypt to this point. He would use the Babylonian empire to bring this judgment on Judah. You remember King Nebuchadnezzar, that name? Even if you've not been in church, you probably remember that king. This is the same period of time where Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were taken as teenagers, as captives to Babylon. Babylon. This is the same period of time as Ezekiel, the prophet. This is when Jerusalem was sacked, destroyed, burned down. Not a fun time to live. Not an easy time to be a worshiper of Jehovah God. All Habakkuk had known in life was violence, death, destruction, and difficulty. Listen, and and yet he knew God. And yet he knew that God loved him and loved him enough, listen, to give him the latitude and the freedom to ask why. People have been asking God why since the beginning. Or some of the heroes of the faith have been asking. Even Jesus on the cross quoted Psalms. My God, my God, why? Right? Now here's what I want you to remember about that. Look at the screen. The question of why God can either lead to spiritual growth or death. A crisis of faith we think is so bad, but it actually... If we move towards God during the crisis of faith, it can build us up, it can strengthen us, it can provide more of a solid foundation, or it can be devastating if we move away from God. Think about a college freshman who's grown up in church, grown up in the youth group. They've got the little stickers on their car. They've got the T-shirts. They know the songs. They ate pizza in the youth room over and over and over and over again. They went roller skating. They went on the the conventions and the, 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 the conferences and the camps. But somehow they never owned their faith. 
the foundation was weak and they go into a secular college in a secular environment, which I'm not saying is bad at all, but they go into a secular uh, atheistic worldview that they've never experienced before with, a, with a, a professor who's an atheist and they are belittled and made fun of for even believing in Jesus. And if their, their, their faith is, is weak and it's not become their own, we, we were seeing thousands of these young people move away from the Christian faith because of that very reason. It's a crisis that goes the bad, a bad way. It all depends, listen, on how we define and embrace biblical faith. Because whether you realize it or not, as believers, everything that we experience, we're filtering it through our Christian faith. And so if our faith is weak, if our faith is, I'll use this, incomplete, if our faith is misplaced, this crisis can lead to some real problems and even walking away from our faith altogether. Aren't you glad you came to church today? But if we understand and apply true biblical faith, which we're going to talk about today, a crisis can actually reinforce and strengthen our faith and our walk with Christ. Let me frame it this way. We'll move on. The problem is not me wondering or even asking God why. Because he can certainly handle that question. The problem arises when my faith is not adequate to receive his reply. Because sometimes the response is not what I want, Matthew. So with all that in mind, let's look at Habakkuk and his prayer. Habakkuk chapter one, beginning with verse two. Today I'm in the New Living Translation on the screen. Habakkuk prays, how long, O Lord? (laughs) Can you relate to that? How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. That sounds like a Tuesday night at the house. No, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Verse, (laughs) it's like playing Monopoly or something. No. Verse 4, the law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has been perverted. Now, we're, we're tempted at reading that last verse to be, oh, that's, that's, that's us. That's, that's 2022. Be careful with that comparison because it's nothing like what he was going through. Yes, There are issues. Yes, it's dark. Yes, the United States is going in the wrong direction uh, spiritually, and all of those things are true, but we, we can't even imagine what he's going through. You would have to live somewhere like North Korea or Afghanistan as a believer to even come close to this, okay? So be careful with that comparison. It was horrible. Can you feel the desperation in this? Can you feel maybe the hopelessness, helplessness? This is a prophet of God. This is a man who walked with God, and yet he's right there in this situation. But here's what I want you to remember. It's honest. It's it's raw, but it's real. And so I want you to remember this, first point. Be emotionally honest about your situation. Don't be afraid of getting it out with God. I'm not talking about being disrespectful. I'm not talking about, you know, all this stuff. Uh, And and listen, I'm just saying don't gloss it over. Don't try to sweep it under the rug if you're going through something difficult, if you're in in a season of pain. Don't lie to yourself. Now, I know about positive thinking. I know about keeping a good attitude. I'm not talking about going off the deep end of despair, kind of like Elijah did last week. But I am talking about being honest with yourself and honest with God about what you're going through. That's what Habakkuk was doing, and I think it's healthy for us to do as well. So he lays it out there, and then God answers. Verse 5, the Lord replied, look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. 
I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. And I'm sure Habakkuk's thinking, oh, good. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, why not? I'm so glad that you're using an even more wicked people to judge our wicked people. It was an answer, but it wasn't the answer he was hoping for. So how do we deal with an answer from God that we don't like, that we weren't praying for, that we weren't hoping for? That's what today's about. The rest of chapter 1 is then Habakkuk pushing back against that, arguing, complaining a little bit more about that answer, kind of wrestling with God. I know none of us have ever thought or done that, so I'm just going to move right on to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. This is Habakkuk talking. He says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait. Say wait. I will wait and see what the Lord says and how he will answer my latest complaint. <laughs> now, this is symbolism. He's not actually up in a watchtower physically. He was, going, he was giving us a spiritual picture of how we should wait on the Lord. Something that we're all so good at. Right? So what does going up to the watchtower mean? And how does it help us to wait patiently on the Lord to answer? The verse says he climbed up. Say up. He climbed up. That means he was, write this down, he was changing his perspective. None of us like to wait on anything. We are the most impatient people on the planet in the history of the world. You can ask my family. I'll go eat with the senior adults at 3.30 in the afternoon so I don't have to wait on a table at 6. I will. I won't even be hungry, but I'll go. At the grocery store, I do my research before I get in line. She looks like she knows what... And I always pick the wrong line. We don't like to wait on anything. Our culture has, has developed in us this need for speed. That, the movie, anyway. That was cool. We need the need. Sorry, that's Top Gun, right? Yeah. Get a little distracted every now and then. Our culture has put this thing in us that we have to have everything. Faster internet, faster food, faster this. If you're, if you're in business and you're not fast, forget it. We're impatient people, and yet from cover to cover, it tells us the importance of patience and waiting on God. But here's the deal. Look at the screen. We will never be able to wait patiently on God unless we change our spiritual perspective. And I call this going to the balcony. Habakkuk called it going up to the watchtower. This discipline of going up will actually help you in everyday life. It'll help you in your marriage. It'll help you uh, with conflict resolution. It'll help you with if your business, business negotiations. It's a discipline of getting out of your shoes, pulling yourself back from all the details of the situation. You've ever heard you can't see the forest because of the... That's what I'm talking about. You have to get up out of the situation, out of the argument, out of the negotiation, see it from above, try to get into their shoes, their perspective, in this case, God's, and you'll be able to pray and wait more effectively. That's what he's doing. Now, I want you to hear me. This is so important. Your capacity to go up with God, to gain a new perspective, is a huge indicator of your maturity. It's a marker of your maturity. Just like when you were little and you got, you know, your parents or whoever marked the, the door frame as you got taller and taller. And it's the same idea. Your ability to get out of your shoes and out of your concerns and out of your selfishness and out of your own opinion. We love our opinions. 
But your ability to get out of that and to see the whole situation and pray about that and and worry about and, and think about that instead of just yourself, it's a marker of your maturity. And until you learn how to do that, you're going to continue to go around the same mountain of problems over and over again. Now, that was worth the price of admission right there. And you're very quiet. But that is truth. You've got to gain a new perspective if you want to learn how to pray effectively, wait effectively on God. It's not easy, but it's absolutely necessary. Habakkuk was like, I don't get this. The the Babylonians, really? I don't understand this, but I'm going to go up so that I can pray with a new perspective. Verse 2, the Lord said to me, Write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. The others, that's us. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, say slow. Slow. Oh, no. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently. No. For it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. I can't spend any more time in chapter two, but the main thing I want us to remember from this passage, write this down. God is playing the long game. God is playing the long game. God's redemption plan, his salvation plan for humanity is long and it's predetermined. There's nothing in hell, nothing on earth that can stop it. Revelation 13, 8 declares that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Now, some of God's decisions, like Habakkuk right here, I'll never understand. Can I just be your pastor and be honest? Some of God's, the pieces in this puzzle, some of his decisions and some of the things that happen, I'll never understand until I get there. I'll never get it, and neither will you. Our finite minds are not capable of piecing everything together and connecting all the dots. God's redemption plan, I want you to hear me, it's predetermined, but my life isn't. Let me say it again. Now, this might conflict with some theology, but if you read the Bible from cover to cover, you'll hear what I'm saying. His salvation plan is going to happen. It is predetermined, but my life isn't. And your life isn't. He has given us free will. Free will. We get to choose whether or not to receive this free gift of eternal life. We get to choose whether or not to participate in this plan. We get to choose whether or not we want to join the ranks of this spiritual movement and live our lives for him or live our lives apart from him as our own Lord and Master. It's a choice. One way leads to spiritual life and the other death. But if we choose the narrow road, the narrow path to eternal life through Christ, we need to, listen, listen, don't, don't. We need to understand that it's no longer just about us. We've connected to something that is eternal. We've connected to something that is bigger than ourselves, much bigger than me, much bigger than you, much bigger than any individual story. By deciding to follow Jesus, I've connected to the eternal. It began way out before I came along. It's going to be there long after I'm gone. God is playing the long game, and we must have faith in his redemptive plan. Now, I know you're quiet, and you're like, what in the world? But you need to hear the truth. Everybody okay? Okay. Ten of you? All right. So God continues his response in verse 4, and we're getting there to the big idea. Verse 4, God says, look at the proud. This is God speaking. He says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked. Now, he's not calling them crooks. He's talking about direction. They have no direction. They have no purpose. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. The King James actually does better. The just shall live by. Paul quotes it. Jesus quotes it. The just shall live by faith. 
And there's that word again, faith. What does it really mean to walk by faith? What does it really mean to have faith? I've taught this little section before, but we have so many new people that I want to teach it again. I think it's important. I think it's life-changing if you will hear it. You need to understand that faith is not one-dimensional. Faith is not one-dimensional. Faith is not just believing that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. I make that decision. I receive him and then go back to life as usual, business as usual. That is the dangerous version of American Christianity that will utterly fail you in the crisis. That is the anemic version of Christianity that will crumble beneath your feet if the worst should happen. That kind of faith provides no foundation. It's like this coin. It has two sides, but it's one coin. Just like this coin, there are two sides of faith. There are two sides of faith. One side is glorious and wonderful and epic and awe-inspiring. This is the side of faith that represents the miracles that we all hope for, that God is certainly able to perform. The writer of Hebrews lists all these examples in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. He goes through all these examples, heroes of the faith, incredible miracles, and then he gets to verse 32 and he says, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. By faith, there's our word, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God has promised. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of the fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the death. It, the death, it's incredible, it's epic, it's beautiful, it's incredible. You, you had immediate answers, immediate healing, immediate relief, immediate comfort. Of course that's what we pray for. Come on. And we should. Because God is able to do all of that. Is anybody here? We sh that's what Habakkuk was praying. And God had certainly done that in times past. But the other side of faith that I'm talking about is also in Hebrews chapter 11. And he changes it. He flips the coin so fast, it's not even a verse change, man. It's, it's in the middle of a verse. He goes from saying women received their loved ones back again from death to the second half of 35, but others, say others, others were tortured. Refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at. Their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. Wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people, say all these people. He's talking about the whole list. Not just the second half, the whole list. All these people, both sides, earned a good reputation because of their faith. Is this coming into your spirit? Listen to me. When we fail to acknowledge this more difficult side of faith, we cheapen the work of Jesus on the cross and every martyr who died for him sin. I think it offends the Lord when we will not acknowledge the harder side, the more difficult side of faith. When we forget about this other side of faith, we do so at our own peril, our own risk, because this more difficult side of faith is what's going to sustain us when the answer isn't what we prayed for, isn't what we hoped for. This is the side of faith that will sustain us. When God doesn't spare us from walking through the crisis, this is the faith that will strengthen us. David understood that. That's why he said, yea, though I walk through the valley. 
not over it, not around it, not delivered from it. When I walk through the valley, that's what Paul's saying in Romans 8, 35. He says, can anything separate us from Christ's love? I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Does it mean God no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecution, hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with life or death? Verse 37 says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus Christ who loved us. I wish you would clap your hands and give God praise for that. I know this is a hard word, but if you will embrace this and receive this, it's a truth that will set you free. It's a truth that will answer the hardest questions that life can possibly bring. In my research, I came across a video of Jonathan Evans. You may have heard of his dad, Dr. Tony Evans. Phenomenal theologian, speaker, pastor, worldwide ministry, but solid, solid. His wife was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And within minutes, they had thousands, thousands of people and hundreds of churches praying for her healing. He had great influence. I mean, we're talking about TDJ. We're talking about the big name. You know, they are, they are on board with this thing. They're doing Jericho marches around the house. I mean, they are praying with, with faith. Does anybody believe they had faith? Absolutely. But she died. And this clip is from their son, Jonathan, at the funeral. And he's just honest about wrestling with God like Habakkuk when he, they get this answer and she dies anyway after they pray. Watch the video. I just want to tell you just for a moment, trust me, I won't be long. I just want to tell you that my thoughts over the past few days, I was wrestling with God. Because I said, well, if we have victory in your name, didn't you hear us when we were praying? Didn't you see the people who are walking around my mom and dad's house like Jericho trying to make sure that they can knock down the walls of this cancer? Didn't you hear the prayers of, 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 of Bishop T.D. Jakes and Brian Carter and Antioch and Friendship West and Gateway in the village? Didn't you hear all of those prayers? Didn't you hear us? Where are you? Why didn't you do what we were asking of you? Because your word says... That if we abide in you and, and your word abides in us, then we could ask whatever we will and it will be given to us. Your word tells us that, that, that if we ask according to your will that you hear us. Your word is, is, is telling us that in Mark 11, if you pray believing, you will receive. To be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplication, make your request known. Where are you? I was wrestling with God the last few days. Because this was a great opportunity that we can tangibly see your glory. Everybody was praying, not only in Dallas, but around the country and around the world. People were watching. Where are you? This was an opportunity for us to see your glory. And as I was wrestling with God, he answered. And he said, number one, you don't understand the nature of my victory. Because just because I didn't answer your prayer your way doesn't mean that I haven't already answered your prayer anyway. Because victory was already given to your mom. You don't understand. Because of the victory that I have given you, there was always only two answers to your prayers. Either she was going to be healed or she was going to be healed. Either she was going to live or she was going to live. Either she was going to be with family or she was going to be with family. Either she was going to be well taken care of or she was going to be well taken care of. Victory belongs to me.
because of what I've already done for you, the two answers to your prayer are yes and yes. Because victory belongs to Jesus. Then he said to me, You need to understand that I am God and that I am sovereign and my game plan is bigger than any one player on my field. So you need to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on you but lean on me because I have the ability to make this crooked situation straight. I am the sovereign God. That's why they say that I am that I am. As high as the heavens are above the earth are my ways from your ways and my thoughts from your thoughts. We don't think the same. If God wants to get glory from a miracle, then praise the Lord. He can do it. He's done it before. He'll do it again. But if God should choose to receive glory, even through my pain, even through my valley, even through my death, he is God and he is still good. See, we try to attach the goodness of God to an an outcome. The goodness of God has nothing to do with an outcome. It has to do with who he is. And he is always good. And the ugly truth is that we live in a sin-impacted, sin-filled world. The two sides of faith, they are not mutually exclusive, you understand. It's not one side or the other. It's both and. They are not in contradiction. They are in perfect unity. We cannot make the mistake of focusing on one side or the other. We can't just preach about one side and not the other. I'm going to say something at the risk of offense. And if you are offended by either one of these little statements, you need to pray about it. Don't just be offended. Pray about it. You know offense is a trap of the devil. That's all it is. The prosperity gospel, which gets gets a lot right, but it focuses all on one side the miracle, the blessing, the wealth. If you don't have the miracle, if you don't get the wealth, if you don't get the blessing, well, then you didn't have enough faith. And that's damaging and it's dangerous. But then the other side, the reformed side of theology, focuses all on the suffering and the pain. And they get a lot right too. But some in that camp don't even acknowledge that God still does miracles. But my God, you see, I don't have to just go one side or the other. My God has given me a whole faith. He's given me a complete faith. He's given me a solid foundation to stand on. So I continue to believe and pray and trust God for the impossible because he's a miracle working God. But I also trust in his sovereignty and trust in his hand and his strength when the storm is raging. Show on up. Jesus. Do you feel the holiness of God in this place? Oh, God, help us. God, help us to step out of this American version of Christianity. Lord, help us, please, to step into your plan 
in your word. You know how Habakkuk ends? It's the most powerful, some of the most powerful scripture in the whole Bible. He doesn't understand. He's still arguing with God. He's still, he's still like, I don't understand this. But then he gets to Habakkuk chapter 3, and he says, even though, say even though, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my salvation. Even though, yet I will. Even though, yet I will. Even though the problem is not coming out like I thought, even though the, the, the prayer wasn't answered like I was hoping for, I will yet rejoice in God my Savior because He is sovereign and He knows best. Verse 19, He makes my, me as sure-footed as a deer and enables me to go upon the heights. When we were in Israel a couple of years ago, we got to go into En Gedi where David hid from Saul. And our guide talk, taught, taught us about these, these, these deer. We think of a deer, we think of we're in a deer stand and going to shoot a deer. That's not the kind of deer he's talking about. He's talking about the mountain ibex. Looks more like a goat. Put a picture of that. That's a sheer cliff. And he's just, I don't know what he's doing, licking the wall. I don't know what he's doing. He's just having a day on this sheer cliff. I mean, we see one misstep and he's dead. But see, God has created him to walk on the heights. God has created him to walk in those treacherous places. And I'm telling you today, church, if we will receive a whole faith from God and walk in a whole faith of Jesus Christ, he will enable us to go on the heights of his glory. He will enable us to walk in treacherous places, to go through whatever he calls us to go through and come out on the other side with a victory in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. I wish somebody would clap your hands. I wish somebody would praise God for his faithfulness. His goodness and His mercy. Yes, glory, glory. That's it, the glory of the Lord. The last thing I want you to remember, we're, we're done. I want you to remember this. Our faith is in God, not an outcome. Our faith is is in God, not a miracle. Our faith is in God, not a political party. Our faith is in God, not another person. Our faith is in God. And if it remains in Him, we will have a firm foundation on which to stand. Even though, yet I will. Even though, yet I will. Would you bow your heads?